welcome to another episode of Policy Talks. And today we have uh, the celebrated best-selling author, Sangeet Paul Chaudhary with us. Sangeet is very well known for, as a thought leader, uh, his book, Platform Economics, Platform Revolution, actually uh, is a seminal work and has influenced, uh, you know, digital experts and digital practitioners all across the world. Uh, uh, he's going to be talking to us about the way uh, platform economy plays into public policy. Uh, what is the uh, impact of AI in the platform economics? And how does uh, all this fit into the DPI world? So welcome to the show, uh, Sangeet. Great to have you here. Thank you, Yatish. It's a pleasure to be here. So uh, our Basically, we have divided this into three sessions. And uh, the first session is basically, Sangeeta, which I want to talk to you about is how public policy plays in the platform world. And, um, you know, platforms have changed business dynamics, has influenced uh, uh, both national and global economics. Uh, it is also changing society and democracy in variety of forms. Now, how do you see public policy being shaped by platforms over the next few years? Yeah, I think it's a it's a unique time when you think about the platform economy. It's, it's fairly unique compared to previous technological revolutions because a lot of previous technological revolutions could be classified as tools. They were tools yeah. that could be used by users and, uh, you know, users could uh, change their behavior around the tool, but the tool was not fundamentally actively influencing the change of behavior and the change of uh, market activity around itself. Uh, what happens with platforms is uh, a lot of platforms when they are, uh, you know, when they uh, get re regulated or questioned they they claim that they are tools but uh, they are not just tools they also actively shape behavior around themselves because of the data that they capture and the ability to engage users on the interface they have the ability to uh, manage behavior design and fundamentally change behavior of users in response to the data that they're capturing so it's not as simple as saying the bicycle with a tool and uh, you know facebook is a tool uh, it's it's much more complex than that because of this feedback loop towards behavior design that that platforms have now behavior design is how it impacts the impacts the individual but the fact that platforms are intermediaries and are hence able to impact social and cultural and economic activity makes it even more complex and so this combination of the fact that you're not just a tool around which behavior is being shaped, but you're actively shaping that behavior. And then you're actively shaping interactions, multi-party interactions. Those have significantly larger implications than how you would regulate usage of tools. And so that's one factor that makes the platform economy unique. Uh, the second thing that makes the platform economy unique is just the fact that the what we typically see in uh, in our usage of platforms are not merely first order effects of changes that are being made to the working of these platforms, but are often second, third order effects. Uh, there are two aspects to it. One is the fact that platforms themselves are opaque to regulators. Uh, the inner workings are not very visible and we can talk about how to address that, uh, but opacity of platforms is one aspect. But the second piece is that the platforms are opaque to the even to the people who are making these platforms. Because if I take a simple example, when Facebook uh, was, uh, you know, evolving as a platform, uh, Facebook used to use this tool internally called FB Learner. And essentially, that was a, a tool where engineers would go in and they would throw in some uh, different weights and check, uh, you know, different uh, parameters to the algorithms and see what kind of effects it had. And so the changes were not being made by design. They were being made by trial and error. The challenge with that is you don't really know what the second and third order effect of such a trial and error is going to be. Uh, to what extent is it going to uh, you know, move once a feedback loop sets in? So my key point over there is that platforms are opaque, yes, to the regulators, but even more, uh, you know, even to some extent to the, to the players who are creating them. And because of that, it's extremely difficult to unpack the workings of a platform. And this becomes even more complex once you bring AI into the mix because yeah. of the ability of AI to create self-learning loops. Yeah. So those are the two key, key ideas in terms of how to think about public policy within the platform world. So, so what should uh, you know, a public policy researcher or a public policy practitioner do 
uh, if they want to reduce this opacity, have a modicum of control uh, on certain aspects or negative aspects of these platforms? So uh, the first part of it, I would say, is uh, uh, first of all, you know, uh, the, the starting point is that we need to rethink how we necessarily do public policy. It cannot be uh, based around episodic regulation. Uh, you know, it cannot be based around the fact that uh, things have broken and now we need a new policy to shape up. Uh, when you're working with platform companies, you need to actively understand the design of uh, a particular platform and shape yeah. policy in which a simple example is that uh, if a lot of platforms have a reputation system, which is essentially used to manage quality on the platform. Highly yeah. reputed, reputed players are given more visibility versus low reputed players. Now, the design of the reputation system itself can fundamentally change how people get impacted. So there are rewarding reputation systems that will reward you if you do well. And then there are punishing reputation systems that will not reward you, but they will certainly punish you. So yeah. an example is... Airbnb, if you do well, you get to earn more as a host. Uber, if you do well, you still earn the same. But if you do not do well, you get kicked out. So the way you regulate one form of reputation system from another form, you need to really understand the dynamics of how these reputation systems are working. So my key point there is that in order for public policy to really apply in the platform world, the first point at which we need to start is really understand the mechanics and the design of platform businesses in the first place. So that's, you know, in terms of how we think about uh, regulating platforms. The second piece is how we actually uh, work on regulating platforms. It's, uh, I, I would say that for platform regulation uh, to be effective, you need to have a form of continuous regulation where you're constantly gaining visibility into the platform through data that is being shared. Uh, and you're constantly keeping the platform managers accountable to certain metrics and ensuring that they share data that matches those metrics. And that's the only way in which you can manage the, the evolution of regulation or manage the, the learning cycle of regulation at the rate at which the platform is evolving. Uh, there, there have been some efforts, uh, you know, in, in Europe, there have been some data sharing efforts between platforms like Airbnb and the government. Uh, in India now, we are seeing the rise of uh, public technology alongside public policy. So there's potentially some uh, greater level of accountability that can be done there when you know private platforms are built on public technology. But my point is that unless you have this uh, feedback loop between the two, uh, uh, between the regulator and the platform, you're not going to effectively regulate it. And the final thing I would just say over here is that uh, in order to effectively regulate platforms, it's not going to just happen inside policy chambers. It's going to happen uh, by really opening out the, uh, the uh, or really by attacking the opacity and opening out the data of the platform to other stakeholders who can uh, competitively come in and uh, uh, you know provide alternatives. Uh, whether it's a tech player uh, using that data to provide an API negotiation tool to uh, uh, you know a seller on a platform, those are the ways in which you can effectively regulate the platform rather than just through policy alone. So uh, there is a school of thought which says that, uh, uh, you know, which has been uh, proposing and, you know, we CIPP belongs to that school of thought, which says that public policy can no longer be written in a legislative form through a law, because law is, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, written in uh, stone, and it does not change with the change in uh, data or change in policy. Hence, public policy has to be written in, in a software code and that software code has to adapt to the way the data is signaling it to adapt. And hence, the implementation of public policy and the writing of public policy has to change from uh, a, a direction from the government to a, uh, you know, a platforming uh, policy which actually reacts, acts, and controls, manages based on the data uh, the, that uh, the platform shares. Mm -hmm. um, and this this view has, um, I mean, it's the the view has started forming, but uh, uh, it's not yet converted into actual, uh, you know, change in public policy anywhere. Correct me if I'm wrong. If any country or any uh, anybody has 
attempted to address platforms through platform public policy? No, I, I think uh, increasingly a lot of countries understand this, but they have not really, uh, as far as I know, they've not really effectively uh, done this. Now, you, uh, you said that the bigger issue is opacity and uh, and the only way to address it is data sharing. And now data sharing is where the biggest challenge or the biggest pushback comes from platforms because uh, data to them is competitive uh, information. That is what drives their user behavior. That's what drives their engagement. And they don't want to share any data with any regulator. Um, and to the extent that uh, they, uh, even if you assign accountability of individuals, uh, they change um, the, the individuals per se, and uh, they even change the location of those platforms to avoid sharing those data. Is there a way to address this data opacity problem uh, in any other way? You know, I, I can I can think of only uh, two ways that. Uh, in, in which you can gain some level of negotiating path against the platform to address this data opacity problem. One is if the platform is uh, uh, you know, engaging in some form of uh, licensable activity or regulated activity and in exchange for that license, you require the platform to share that data. Um, and uh, to some extent, uh, European countries have tried this piecemeal, uh, but this can be effectively done even more so once you know, platforms uh, uh, start entering healthcare and other uh, uh, parts of uh, life where regulation is even more important. So um, even though it sounds uh, traditional and old fashioned, licensing and requiring the data to be uh, provided in, in exchange for that license is one way to do it. The second way uh, I, I feel, which is uh, uh, what is being tried out in India to a large extent also in Singapore and a few other countries is to really build out digital public infrastructure, digital technologies, uh, gain mass adoption on that and require private, I mean, essentially attract private platforms to build on top of that. And over there, uh, you again then have greater negotiating power because you sit in, inside the stack rather than sitting completely outside the stack. And uh, especially with the, you know, the direction in which uh, data regulation and AI regulation is going in India, I I'm hopeful that that is uh, one place where the fact that platforms are building on top of digital technology can, even if they don't share, uh, you know, we don't necessarily need sharing of data to as much as we need regulation and monitoring by metrics. And in order to uh, have the platforms ascribe to and, uh, uh, you know, play within certain metrics, uh, having digital technology would be one of the ways in which you can achieve that. This would make sense in, uh, say, the space of FinTech or, it might not make sense in the space of social media. It would make sense in health tech also, but uh, in social media, there is no licensing. There is no licensing for e-commerce either. So are you suggesting or recommending that these spaces needs licensing of some forms? Um, to be, uh, you know, to be honest in those spaces, I think the ship has sailed to some extent uh, because the platforms have gained global traction. Uh, unless you start banning platforms the way you know TikTok has been banned in certain countries, you don't really have a way to get back negotiating power in those spaces. So I don't, uh, you know, I, I don't really see uh, a license approach as uh, even being the right approach from an innovation perspective. If anything, the large platforms will figure out a way to lobby their way out of it, and the smaller upstarts will, uh, you suffer. know, yeah. suffer as a result. So. Um, while this is not a great, uh, you know, answer to that question, I, I do think the ship has sailed on some of these, uh, uh, you know, use cases where platforms have gained global domination. Um, you can, uh, you can, you can essentially, um, uh, I think the positive part of it is that a, a lot of other parts of the economy, which are highly uh, uh, vulnerable to this kind of platform intermediation if uh, it goes unchecked, uh, you can solve that through licenses and through requiring uh, some level of uh, entry compliance before the platform can come in and start 
providing its services. So over there, especially in, in uh, use cases that are highly fragmented by country, because social media e-commerce are very, uh, you know, country agnostic to some to, to some extent, but healthcare financial services are highly fragmented by country because of regulation. So that's where, to some extent, regulators can have a bigger say. And again, you know, I would classify that as the Europe uh, approach that is being tried out right now. I'm a bigger fan of the other, you know, the India or Singapore approach, which is more of let's build the technology on which these platforms start building as well. Uh, you're saying that, uh, you know, really disappoints me because, you know, I was looking for a pat answer there, but I, I know there are no pat answers in this, uh, uh, you know, particularly in the case of e-commerce. And particularly if the platform has already morphed into, you know, what could be called as a super app, that means playing in entertainment, it's playing into e-commerce, it's also playing into communication, you know, uh, which part do you, some part may be licensable, but it is very difficult to license the whole, um, and, and that is where the data actually lies, you know. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And especially when when platforms uh, spill across uh, different vertical boundaries, uh, regulating one vertical is not going to solve the problem. Uh, regulating across the board is going to harm the consumer before it harms any, anybody else because the consumer is getting value. And so at that point, once uh, when you have both these conditions of, a, a platform expanding across geographical boundaries because the use case is so horizontal and B, a platform spilling over across vertical boundaries because it has uh, the the it has successfully engaged the consumer and can move them in new directions. Once you reach that kind of scale, it, it becomes much more difficult to do this systemically. That is where we are seeing more of the, the active regulation at this point in time.